Hello everybody and welcome back to my channel or if you're new here, my name is Rachel and welcome to my channel. I am so happy to have you here to help spread these stories and help speak for the victims who cannot speak for themselves. Before we get into today's video, I just wanted to go ahead and address something really quick. I've seen a couple comments of some of you asking, you know, when am I going to speak about what's going on in the world right now? And there's a lot going on in the world right now and I've kind of said some things on Twitter, Instagram, I have shared some links in the bios of some of my videos, but I haven't really taken the time to talk about these issues on my channel yet. And I will say that I pre-record a lot of the videos that I make a week or two ahead of time because I'm a full-time medical student. I am doing a full-time clinical rotation right now. So I'm working 40 hours a week and you know, just to stay on task and stay on schedule, I make sure to pre-record. So a lot of the videos that you see are a week, two weeks after I actually recorded them. So that might be why some of the cases kind of don't align with what's going on in the world right now. But I will say that I am working on a lot of things behind the scenes to speak up for these victims. I have been working on a lot of cases for victims who have fallen you know, to police brutality and who belong to these underserved communities. So I just wanted to go ahead and put that out there to stay tuned for those coming videos in the next few weeks. And like I said, I know I haven't talked a lot about what's going on in the world right now and I know that there's so many people that need so much help and I want to use my channel to do exactly that. And you guys know that. So like I said, just stay tuned for the coming videos and there are going to be a lot of videos on those types of cases that need the extra help. So just wanted to go ahead and say that really quick. But either way, today's video is about a young woman from Northern Ireland who went missing. We don't know a lot of information about the night that she went missing. And honestly, while there is a decent bit of information, I found it difficult to find a lot of actual details if that makes sense. So articles would kind of say that something happened, they would state what happened, but then they wouldn't really say the result of that or they wouldn't give much more detail about this actual event, if that makes sense. So I do feel like there is some information missing, but I still think that her case is very important to talk about since it's been 15 years since she went missing with absolutely zero answers. So with all of that being said, let's just get right into today's case. Today, we're going to be discussing the unsolved disappearance and probable murder of Lisa Dorian. Lisa Dorian was born on June 12th, 1979 to her parents, Pat and John Dorian. She was from Bangor in County Down, Northern Ireland. She was a member of a very close knit family, being the oldest of her three sisters, Joanne, Michelle, and Ciara. She was described as being outgoing, fun, and was always in the center of attention from the time that she was just a young child. She was smart, funny, witty, and very popular. She was adventurous and was talking about moving to Spain to start a new life in the sun shortly before her disappearance. She had been in an accident shortly before her disappearance and was actually expecting a payout of 60,000 pounds, which is about 75,000 US dollars. There was so much that she was looking forward to before everything turned out for the worst. At the time that she went missing, Lisa was 25 years old and working as a shop assistant. A little while, about six weeks before she went missing, she had split up with her boyfriend, Jimmy Mills. After this, her family said she kind of started to act a little bit strange. They had said that she had started to make friends in a new area. Her ex-boyfriend said that while they were dating, they had pretty much spent every single day together. She hadn't been into any sort of, you know, drug or alcohol or, you know, drinking activities. But after they broke up, she had just been spending so much time with these new people in Valley Halber. I am sorry if I'm saying these names wrong again. It's Northern Ireland. I'm from America, so... I might be pronouncing them wrong. But either way, these friends seem to be a very bad influence on Lisa and were involved in all sorts of drug use, drinking, and partying. With her naturally outgoing and adventurous personality, this seemed like a very bad mix for Lisa. So on the evening of February 27th, 2005, 
Lisa had been partying in a home of a woman named Naomi Drysdale. Later that night into the morning of February 28th, Lisa went over to a different party in a Bally Heart Caravan Park. Now, this is a popular site for vacationers and party goers during the summer months. However, since it was still pretty early spring, the area was pretty much deserted because it was still pretty cold out. This party did involve a lot of drugs and drinking and Lisa and several of her friends were partying in a caravan on site. And one of these people that were at the party with her was a man named Mark Levette who was the park's groundsman at the time. We don't know a lot about what happened at that party, but what we do know is that after going to this party, no one has seen or heard from Lisa Dorian ever again. When Lisa didn't return from the party right away, Lisa's family wasn't too concerned at first. Obviously at this time we know that she did like to party and being involved in that lifestyle means that you don't always come home exactly when you say you are going to or when you're expected to. However, when another day passed without seeing or hearing from Lisa, the family started growing more and more worried. Lisa's father said that not being in contact with her family was completely out of character for Lisa. They would always be in contact at least every few days, so when the days had passed and they still had never been in contact with each other, they reported her missing. So of course, the first thing that police did was interview the people at the party, but as you can imagine, everyone at the party was under the influence, so anything they said really was not reliable. However, there was one individual involved with the party who was sober and had information about that night who was able to help police come up with a timeline of the night. So this witness said that Lisa and Mark Levette, the man that I mentioned earlier, had been hallucinating that night at the party. So I don't know if Lisa and Mark had left the party at this point, but I will assume that they had since this witness said that he called Mark at around 1.15 a.m. that night to check and see if the two of them were okay. He said that Mark had pretty much just rambled incoherently on the phone about how he was seeing things before he just hung up on him. So then police went ahead and talked to Mark Levette. He told them that around 5.45 a.m., him and Lisa ran out of the caravan after seeing flashing lights and hearing sounds that made them paranoid. He said that they had pretty much just ran into the darkness until the two went their separate ways and they completely lost each other. He said that he tried calling her cell phone after the two had lost each other, but she didn't answer. So according to Lisa's ex-boyfriend, Mark had called him at around 5 a.m. that same day to see if he knew where Lisa was, and of course he didn't. So using this and other you know, cell phone information, police believe that is actually at this point, 5 a.m. at the phone call, that they believed that Lisa had already been dead. They said that they believed that Lisa was alive between 10 and 10.30 p.m. and that something happened between 10.30 and 1.15 a.m. that caused Lisa's death. Then between 1.15 a.m. and 4.45 a.m., something was done to her body before Mark went ahead and called the ex-boyfriend. So the police went ahead and searched the caravan where she had been last seen for her belongings, and they had seen her handbag and other personal belongings that were left there. They did a forensic examination on the caravan as well, but they found that there was no blood anywhere inside. But at this point, police really had no idea where she was or what could have happened to her because the state that everyone was in, the information that they did have wasn't totally reliable. So by March 6th, the family went to the media to ask if anyone knows anything about what could have happened. At this point, they were just hoping that she was still just missing and was out there somewhere and that she was okay. They made a plea to her and basically said that if she sees anything with the police and the media, that it doesn't matter, that they just want her to come home. Of course, police had searched the caravan and the area around it to see if there was any sign of Lisa, but when weeks had passed and still nothing came up, they beefed up their searches big time. They did an extensive air and land searches along the Arts Peninsula. They sent in divers to do underwater searches. Her family and friends had stepped in to help search the grounds around the area. 
Police started stopping traffic in Valley Heart at around 5 a.m. that Monday, exactly one week after she disappeared, to ask around and see if they could jog anyone's memory if they possibly saw something. Now, up to this point, they had been, you know, assuming that she may have been murdered, but they obviously were more investigating it as a missing persons case, but by March 15th, 2005, they switched the investigation over to a murder investigation. Now, at this point, there was graffiti that had suggested that the Loyalist Volunteer Force was linked to her murder. So, I had no idea what this was when I first looked into it, so I did a bit of research to figure out what this was all about, but if I'm being honest, I still don't know 100% what it's all about, so I'm just going to do my best to try and explain it to you. So the Loyalist Volunteer Force is a small Loyalist paramilitary group in Northern Ireland that was formed in 1996 by a man named Billy Wright when he split from the Ulcer Volunteer Force. So basically, these loyalist paramilitary groups were vigilante groups that were formed originally in 1912 to stop the British government from granting self-rule to Ireland or to exclude Usler from it. Again, I am so sorry if I am pronouncing the names of all these towns wrong. They have fought against several groups throughout history, including the Irish Republicanism. Many of their killings included Irish Catholic civilians who they had claimed were helping the Irish Republican Army. Then we have the Red Hand Commando, which is basically just a small, very secretive Ulster Loyalist paramilitary group that is closely linked to the UVF. It's named after the Red Hand of Ulster, who has a motto of Red Hand to Victory. They are involved in the same beliefs and practices as the UVF, and it is believed that they have let the UVF take credit for a that they have committed. These paramilitary groups are currently listed as terrorist organizations, though they are still very active to this day, and we will learn more about their involvement with Lisa's case throughout the video. This is a very brief summary of these groups, and again, I still feel like I don't have a firm grasp of them completely, so if you are interested in learning more, just do a quick Google search for these different organizations and you'll find a ton of information about these groups. Or if you are from Northern Ireland and you know a lot about these groups, please feel free to comment below and give us all the information that you know. Okay, so like I had said, there had been several walls that were covered in graffiti of the LVF taking responsibility for Lisa's murder. It came out that the members of the UVF and the Red Hand Commando had been doing their own investigation into Lisa's murder at the same time as the police's investigation. They definitely believed that the LVF was responsible. The UVF was enemies of the LVF since the LVF had separated themselves from them like I mentioned. The UVF had interrogated two teens that were known to have been involved in the LVF to see if they could get any information out of them. David Irvine, the then leader of the Progressive Unionist Party, which was close to the UVF, also believed that the LVF was involved. He said, quote, I mean, the smart money says that it's a very tiny number of people and if you push them hard enough, people will name them to you. So names are being banded about. Let's not kid ourselves. So Lisa's mother had said that she was willing to speak to the loyalist paramilitary groups about her daughter, but she said that she didn't want any retaliation or comeback. However, at this point, the police had said that this type of speculation was not helpful to the investigation. None of these organizations had any legal backing or any actual authority to investigate a crime. They believed that them claiming to be responsible was preventing people from coming forward with information for fear of being harmed. By the end of April, there was still absolutely no sign of Lisa and the family was desperate for any clues. They put out a £10,000 reward for any information leading to the recovery of Lisa's body because again, at this point, they were going off of the assumption that she had likely been killed. They just wanted the chance to bring her home and give her the proper burial. So as the investigation was going on, police started to suspect that Lisa's body was hidden in the water around the Ards Peninsula. So police came to the media to speak to the public and ask anyone to come forward if they were a boat owner, if they had suspected that their boat had been tampered with at around the time that Lisa went missing. They had also asked that anyone who had privately bought or sold a boat since the beginning of February of that year to come forward. 
However, as far as I've seen, nothing actually really came of this. Years had passed with no leads, but the investigation into her murder continued. By October of 2012, police searched an area of farmland near Cumber County Down to see if they could find a vehicle that is thought to have been used in the murder. They searched the area using new forensic technology that they had said hadn't been available when she initially went missing, but again, as far as I know, nothing came of this. Once again, the investigation was at a standstill and everyone was pretty much losing all hope. But then on June 28th, 2015, a convicted murderer claimed that he actually knew what happened to Lisa. So a man named Jimmy Seals came forward to a newspaper called The Sunday Life saying that Lisa had been killed and buried in a sealed container on an illegal landfill site near Ballywagon County Down. Again, this is one of those things that I saw in a few articles, but found absolutely no further information on, which is really weird that this was just kind of breezed over, but because I only saw it mentioned, it didn't really see anyone go into much further detail, I want to assume that police probably looked into this and found that Jimmy Seals probably was not being truthful or, you know, did not find him to be responsible. Um, otherwise, we obviously still wouldn't be searching and investigating. After this, there had been several more searches throughout the years, with the most recent one being in 2019, but to this day, nothing has been found. One of the most tragic aspects to this case is that in late December of 2015, just after Christmas, Lisa's mother, Pat, had actually died from a massive heart attack. Lisa's sister said, quote, There was no joy left in my mom's life anymore. She loved us and she loved her grandchildren, but there was no real happiness because she knew she'd never see Lisa again. My mom literally died of a broken heart. Whoever made sure Lisa disappeared broke my mother's heart and killed my mother too. They took Lisa from us and finally they took my mom from us. So now let's get into some of the main theories in this case. After 15 years of absolutely no answers, police have one suspect in mind. They believe that this person had strangled Lisa in the caravan and then recruited a close relative to help dump her body. They believe that this person was someone that Lisa had owed money to in relation to drugs. Many people believe that this person is also a part of the UVF. Many people believe that the UVF coming out and trying to do their own investigation was a way to distract attention away from them when in reality, it was one of their men who was responsible. The Sunday Life had been investigating into the UVF's involvement with Lisa's murder, and they believe that for the past three years that Lisa's murderer had been protected by the UVF because he is the son of a member of the Red Hand Commando, who also has a child with the sister of a UVF boss. They said that the UVF knows very well what he did to Lisa, but say that they don't really do anything about it and had even given this man a job at a UVF taxi firm, which involved him taking vulnerable women home at night. The UVF's leader, Bunter Graham, came out with a statement telling the UVF to stop protecting this person. He said that he didn't know about them protecting this individual and he wants to distance them from the murderer. So I don't know a lot about politics over in Northern Ireland, but this seems to be a pretty hefty accusation that does seem to have some backing. But aside from that, I do wanna go ahead and talk about other people who could be involved. The main person believed to be involved is Mark Levette. He was the last person who have seen her alive and has not spoken to police or Lisa's family about what had happened to her after the initial interview. For the past 15 years, he had not broken his silence. Plus, his story from the very beginning seemed very suspect. I will also mention that after her disappearance, he has been convicted of possessing offensive weapons and drugs. So at the very least, we know that he's not totally innocent of any crimes. So to me, that seems like the main person whose name has been brought up in pretty much every article that I've read in connection to being responsible. But I will mention that there are a few other names that have been brought up as possible suspects in the investigation. So a convicted drug dealer named Mark Smith was named in graffiti as being responsible for the murder. I'm not sure whether this was the LVF graffiti that I had mentioned. I 
think that it probably was, but again, I'm not totally sure. But either way, when questioned, he said that he was not responsible and he actually did take a polygraph test that was administered by the Sunday Life newspaper and he passed. I'm not sure what other connection he had to Lisa, whether he was known to be friends with her or provide drugs to her, but this name was one that popped up a lot in the investigation. Obviously, we know that polygraph tests are not the most accurate, but this is all the information that we have, so that's all I really can say about him. Another individual that police had looked into was a woman named Naomi Drysdale, who I had mentioned at the beginning of the video. She was known to have been partying with Lisa the evening before she went missing, and Mark Lovett had actually spent the night at her house that same night. However, she was not at the caravan party, and after questioning, police released her and did not see her as a suspect. I personally think that Mark Lovett must know a lot more than what he has said. I feel like if he was just this innocent guy who was with her right before she went missing, that he would have said something by now. I feel like the only reason to be silent for 15 years is if you are afraid that you will say something wrong and incriminate yourself. If his story is exactly how he said it is, wouldn't he feel at least a little bit guilty? I mean, if he were innocent and his friend who he was hanging out with went missing right after the two were together, I feel like he would at least feel guilty enough to want to do whatever he could to find her. I know that if I had a friend, even if it was a friend that I didn't know too well or maybe didn't even get along with that well, that went missing right after I was with them, especially if it was just the two of us, I would feel horrible. Even if I had absolutely nothing to do with the disappearance, even if I didn't know anything, even if you know, I had no involvement whatsoever, I would still want to do whatever I could to find that person because that's what friends do. And then there's also that added level of, you know, survivor's guilt for feeling bad that something happened to your friend. A lot of people strongly believe that whoever is responsible has a connection to the UVL. I have no idea if Mark is connected to them whatsoever. I hadn't seen any articles that had mentioned that, but just the fact that he was so silent for all these years is very suspicious to me. And whether he's involved in the UVL or not, I still want to believe that he could be involved just given the sheer fact of how suspicious he's looked. And again, I don't know a lot about politics, but if it's anything like US politics, it's always possible that they just pin this on a certain party to push their agenda or do whatever they wanted to do at that time. I really don't know what to think, but whatever happened, I do think that it was something drug related and money related. Police had come out and said that they definitely believe it has something to do with her owing someone money. So because of that, I do think that it definitely has something to do with that. At the end of the day, Lisa's family is still suffering. They've had to live every single day for the past 15 years not knowing where she is or what happened to her or who's responsible. Police have said that they pretty much know who did it. The family says that they know, but they haven't said it publicly. Either way, they are still fighting for Lisa and other victims as well. They have been campaigning in support for a new proposed law called Charlotte's Law that would keep convicted killers in prison until they revealed the location of a victim's body. Now, to me, I think that convicted killers should never leave jail anyways, but this can at least give families of victims hope that they can convince killers to share the locations of their victim's body to give the family some closure. The family said, quote, we are now focusing on getting justice for Lisa. When we get a guilty verdict from the jury, we will make sure that this law is in place so that you are never released from prison until you tell us where Lisa is. If you won't think of Lisa, think of yourself. A lifetime in jail versus telling us where Lisa is now. That is your choice. Lisa did not deserve to have her life taken away from her the way that it most likely was. She had the personality and the drive to make something amazing of herself and a family who would back her in whatever life choices she made. But because she got involved in the wrong group of friends who clearly didn't care about her, made some wrong choices, she had to pay with her life. 
which is absolutely heartbreaking. So that is all I have for today's video. Thank you for listening to Lisa's story. And all I can hope for this video is that I can point enough attention towards her case that it will put pressure on whoever is responsible to come forward with what they know or to spread her face out there to show if anyone has seen her, they might know something, even if they don't realize it. At this point, I believe that someone coming forward is the only way that we will get justice for Lisa. But either way, that is where I'm going to end today's video. If you liked today's video, please make sure to leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime videos every single week. Also, make sure to keep on the lookout for those videos that are coming up in the next few weeks that I mentioned at the beginning of this video. Don't forget to follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send them over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. Every single case that I cover is suggestions directly from that email. So do not hesitate to send your suggestions over. With that, I hope you guys have a great week and I hope to see you next time. Bye.